Now starting off, we have her falling out of her dress. In 2011, JLo had a mishap while on the German TV show When in Das. Now the show was being filmed in Spain when Jennifer suffered the embarrassment in front of a stadium audience as well as other celebrities present on the show. Now not to mention, the show was live. Now she first performed without any incidents, wearing a black mini dress and stilettos. Her second appearance on the show was a sit down interview outside in a bullfighting arena. Now she looked amazing in a long belted dress with a plunging neckline and a matching head wrap. In true JLo style, she had a grand entrance in a horse drawn carriage before taking a seat. Now as JLo was being helped to her seat by the show's host, the front of her dress opened a little bit too much and her entire breast fell out of her dress. Now a crowd of thousands was there to witness the infamous wardrobe malfunction and within, within the hour the picture was on the cover of the world's number one worldwide tabloid and on the internet. Next up is the awkward exchange. Now Jennifer and Ben were spotted out together amid divorce rumors but their outing was just plain awkward and it seemed to make everything worse. Now the couple, joined by Ben's mom, were supporting the actor's son Samuel at his basketball game. As the pair walked in, Jen leaned forward to give Ben a slightly forced looking kiss on the cheek. Now Ben appeared to tense up and it didn't look like he enjoyed it at all. Now did Jen think doing this would show everyone that they're still in love and have no marriage problem? If so, it backfired because many people are calling the interaction forced and awkward. Ben then put his hand around JLo but his hand never fully made contact with her lower back. Now it also seemed like he may have dodged a full on kiss on the lips based on the off kilter nature of the embrace. Now as they walked up the steps of the venue, Ben stayed at least 5 feet apart from JLo who ventured ahead. Ben then took a moment to speak to his mom, looking more at ease before waving his hand at photographers and then they all went inside. And now let's talk about the insensitive comments. Now let me give you some background onto why everyone felt that JLo was trashing belly dancing. So a part of the 2020 Super Bowl performance featured young dancers sitting in glowing cages, which many people assumed represented the immigrant children in cages at the US border. But JLo apparently had a hard time convincing the NFL to do this and says quote, I'm trying to give you something with substance, not just us out there shaking our effing butts and effing belly dancing. She went on to say that she wanted something real, something that's going to make a statement, something that's going to say we belong here and we have something to offer. Now if you're confused as to why this was controversial, it's essentially because she compared the art of belly dancing to just shaking your butt for the hell of it. In fact, that particular line was shared across Twitter and people were very mad. It was just a little culturally insensitive to say, considering that the dance has been associated with Middle Eastern cultures and it's something that Shakira has become known for, using it to channel her father's Lebanese Syrian Arab roots. Then there's the racism. 20 years ago, Lopez was approaching full actualization as an entertainer, but a single from her second album, JLo, almost derailed her career entirely. The Murder Inc. remix of I'm Real, which features Jerule, and owned radio in 2001, was ruined by the N word she drops in her final verse. Yes, now the issue was that the song was an instant hit, so much so that 10 years later in 2011, Billboard gave it the sixth spot on its 40 biggest duets of all times list. But rightfully so, people were outraged by her use of the loaded term. Not only because she's a Latina artist, but at her level of success where she has a platform and sets an example to young fans, using such a derogatory word is at best offensive. But as the accusations of racism started to mount against her, she eventually spoke out to defend her actions on the Today Show, saying, for anyone to think or suggest that I'm racist is really absurd and hateful to me. Although many people think this is not an excuse, it was later revealed that the track was actually written by Ja Rule himself and he encouraged JLo to say it. Moving on to the price tag. Jennifer has suffered an awkward and somewhat revealing wardrobe malfunction while attending the Dolce & Gabbana fashion show at St. Mark's Square in Venice. Now she managed to show just how much she spent on her outfit, literally. Though someone like JLo has a huge team surrounding her, they missed an important detail in her outfit, as Jennifer wound up with the paparazzi catching the price tag still attached to her outfit. Now the the label was only visible when the cape was blown open from the wind, which made it pretty noticeable in the photos of her outside. Now the singer's bodyguard held her hand while she walked alongside her glam team, who again didn't seem to notice the tag hanging from her, which is just crazy because she has such a big team. Now Jennifer didn't seem to notice it either, and I need to ask, were they planning on returning it? Did they leave it on purpose? And this isn't the first time that this has happened to a star, as a similar incident happened to Megan Markle years back. Now I just want to know why people on their team 
aren't being more attentive to detail as the tag just ruins the whole outfit. Then there's the Mark Anthony romance. Celebrity gossip magazines could not get enough of the power couple in the early 2000s. They were absolutely everywhere and it seemed like fans loved the pairing. But their beginnings as a couple were questionable to say the least. Anthony married former Miss Universe Dianera Torres in 2000 while Jen was dating Ben Affleck around the same time. But the on again off again couple picked their romance back up while Anthony was still married to Dianara. So less than a week after Anthony's divorce was finalized, the couple surprised fans by getting married in a small casual ceremony in her Beverly Hills home in early June. Now it really begs the question to whether or not JLo was some kind of homewrecker because the timeline of the rekindled relationship seemed really off. Now I mean he actually broke the other woman's heart as she said, you go through hell, I cried until there were no tears left, until I was numb, I didn't want to eat, I didn't care to get dressed or take a shower, I just wanted to lie there. Now Anthony's feelings for Jennifer might have been there all along because the two had history, but he should have put more thought into who he chose to marry in the first place, so in a way they're both at fault. On to Ben's love letters. Okay, so this isn't embarrassing because Ben truly loves her, but it's because JLo exposed Ben's love letters without asking him. Now JLo released an album called This Is Me Now and she made a movie for it and then a documentary for it. Now the documentary exposed a lot about JLo and her life and it was called The Greatest Love Story Never Told and it was about the making of the record in the film. Now when her husband Ben Affleck pops up in the doc, it's often to express concern his private love story is being used for something he didn't particularly want. Which hey, can't blame him for that. Now the doc is actually named after a scrapbook Ben gifted Jennifer for Christmas in 2021, stacked with every letter and email they'd written each other over the last 20 years. Now Jennifer showed the book to her producers and songwriters on her first day of making her new album without asking or telling Ben. It became like our bible, she says in the doc. We just left it there in the studio. Now this revelation comes within the first five minutes of the doc and right out of the gate, Ben is not shy about his discomfort. He's shocked that Jennifer would share something so personal with her collaborators and now of course with the world. Then there's the performance gone wrong. In July 2022, while Jennifer was performing, she had a mishap with one of her outfits. While performing, her bodysuit ripped, forming a small visible hole on her backside during one of her songs, but she didn't miss a beat, continuing to sing and dance like the professional that she is. Now she actually posted a video of it laughing at herself on her TikTok page. Jennifer combined the video with the viral sound Oh No by Creepa, and it definitely was an oh no moment indeed. Now this isn't the first time she's had her bodysuit rip while performing, as in 2016, Jennifer was performing for a live audience in Las Vegas when she suffered a wardrobe malfunction towards the end of the show. When she and her other dancers went and thanked the crowd for coming out and taking their final bows, JLo had a mishap with her bodysuit. As she went on to link arms with the background dancers, unfortunately for her when she bent down, the stitch around her hips burst open, showing a bit of skin underneath. Now thankfully it happened at the end of her show, but wow, it sure does seem like this happens often. Next up is her diva behavior. In 1997, JLo had her big break in the film Selena. It was a success with audiences and critics. She was praised for her performance. She has been very successful as an actress and has appeared in numerous films, as well as her popular singing career. Now she's one of the most recognizable and popular celebs in the world, so it makes sense that she has a large staff working for her. Now apparently though, she also makes demands from her staff. In 2012, reports surfaced that Jenny from the block demanded staff working for her make no eye contact or speak with her. While having work done on her San Fernando Valley home, she demanded that none of the helpers, drivers, or contractors have any interactions with her, although these rumors were never confirmed. And reportedly, when flying first class, she doesn't like anyone to bother her, even if it's a flight attendant. One time, a flight attendant offered her a drink and she refused to acknowledge him. She said to her assistant, please let him know I'd like a Diet Coke and lime. Now this rumor hasn't been confirmed, but it does reinforce her diva image. It seems like she doesn't appreciate the help that she gets. And finally, we have too many requests. Now, for those of you who don't know, a rider is a list of requirements or conditions that a star expects in addition to their appearance fee when they are guests on shows or performing on tour. The celebrity gossip Instagram account Demois recently shared a screenshot to reveal Jennifer's demand under a food rider. A source wrote to the IG handle JLo's food rider and it specifically includes pumpkin seed bark thins, which are only available in the fall. Fall, so the production office would have to buy out every store and store them away to make sure they didn't run out until the next fall. 
world. Now, in the following post, the source also confirmed Jennifer Lopez's Beauty Rider, which consisted of expensive skincare products, including the Dr. Hosheka Rose Day Cream, SK11 Essence, and Mass, as well as Lummer Body Lotion, among many others. Upon being asked whether the three time AMA winning songstress asked for those, the source quipped yes. Now, previously, back in October 2020, the celebrity gossip account had shared a photograph of a document that was allegedly the beauty selection of Jennifer's Rider. Now, a total of 90 products were listed in the document, and her demands included 28 hair products, four masks, and two different sunscreens, to name a few. Now, starting off, we have her new album, Flopping. Now, in its first week, Jennifer Lopez's new album, This Is Me Now, debuted on the Billboard 200 at the number 38 spot before dropping off the chart altogether. Now, this was definitely not what she was hoping for with this album. JLo's devastated the album, her first in nearly a decade, did so poorly. She's never experienced this kind of failure. It's humiliating, a source exclusively told In Touch. She poured her heart and soul into this project. It was a huge undertaking. Jennifer released the album in February as a sequel to her 2002 record, This Is Me Then, which was written amid her and Ben Affleck's first engagement. Although the two eventually split in January 2004 and went on to marry other people, they reconciled nearly 20 years later in 2021. Ben proposed in March 2022 and the couple tied the knot that summer. Ben was her muse for both of these projects. Next is that she treats her employees badly. According to several of JLo's former staff members, Jennifer earned herself the nickname Palo because she paid her staff around 50% less than they could make elsewhere, which is crazy because her current net worth is $400 million. But because she had to work hard for her money, she believed that others should work hard too. Now, an incident related to this happened in 2003. Jennifer was spotted in Vegas with her then boyfriend Ben Affleck, and the pair had a big win, and Ben decided to drop a $2,000 tip to the dealer. But before the dealer could scoop up the generous reward, JLo snatched up the cash and swapped it for $200 instead, which is just rude and was not her call. Then she got a maid fired. In 2002, Jennifer starred in the romantic comedy Made in Manhattan. She went all over the world promoting the romantic comedy, and when she landed in London, she had people talking about her demands. When promoting the movie, she had a very interesting encounter with hotel staff, as she stayed at the Metropolitan Hotel and showed her early signs of being a diva. The hotel staff was amazed by her lavish and extravagant demands, as it was something they'd never seen before. Apparently, she requested the hotel staff to provide her with thousands of pounds of lemon scented candles. Not to mention, she only travels in style when it's a short distance. She had seven limousines escort her to lunch at the Dorchester, only 200 yards away. And then in 2012, it was reported that she had a maid fired from her job, although she repeatedly denies it. Jennifer was staying at the Milia Dusseldorf in Germany, and a maid working at the hotel Prey Doja approached the diva's room to get an autograph. Now she spoke with JLo's assistant, who denied her, and the next morning, Prey was fired. She said, a day later, the cleaning company that employed me at the hotel called and said that Miss Lopez had complained. I was fired right there on the phone because of an autograph. Now, Jennifer and the hotel deny that she was fired for that specific reason, as JLo called the story hurtful, but who knows? Now we have her performance demands. In 2013, JLo was set to perform at the opening ceremony of the Indian Premier Cricket League. Now, the event is often compared to the Super Bowl and has quite a large audience. The year before, 56 million viewers tuned in to watch Katy Perry perform, and it was estimated that JLo would get an audience close to 60 million. However, her demands essentially cost her the event. She asked for a large number of hotel rooms for her massive entourage, which included her personal chef and stylist. Now, she also demanded a private plane, and in the end, organizers rejected her requests and instead brought in Pitbull to replace her, as it would cost them less money. Now, I'm sure she thought she was irreplaceable but she wasn't. Now you'd think she'd learn her lesson to not ask for so much after that encounter, but I'm sure she continued on with those demands. Speaking of, let's talk about the demands for American Idol. Listen up everyone, JLo does not come at a cheap price. 
you want her as an American Idol judge, and then you have to pay her $20 million, and that's per season. Yep. It turns out that the pay for sitting in a chair and judging people isn't all that bad, as in 2011, JLo was paid approximately $12 million to replace Simon Cowell on American Idol. Time reports that JLo's American Idol salaries have ranged from $12 to $20 million. While Jen's presence has been credited for rejuvenating the show, the price tag remains shocking. And now that Katy Perry has left the show, there is rumors about JLo replacing her, but again, that will come at a huge price. Then there's her cancelled tour. On May 31st, it was announced that Jennifer's This Is Me Live summer tour was cancelled. Live Nation confirmed the cancellation to the Associated Press, stating Jennifer is taking time off to be with her children, family, and close friends. In addition, Jennifer released a statement of her own on her On The JLo website, explaining the reason behind the cancellation. She wrote, I'm completely heartsick and devastated about letting you down. Please know that I wouldn't do this if I didn't feel it was absolutely necessary. She added, I promise I'll make it up to you and we will all be together again. I love you all so much. Until next time. The This Is Me Live tour would have been Jennifer's first in five years. It was going to be in support of her first solo album in 10 years, This Is Me Now, and its companion film. Now, rumor has it that poor ticket sales and an impending breakup with her husband of two years, Ben Affleck, might have contributed to the tour's cancellation, and this would explain why she needed to spend time with her loved ones. Moving on to lying about plastic surgery. Jennifer has been accused of getting plastic surgery many times, but each time she denies it. In 2013, when a UK-based plastic surgeon analyzed pictures of her on Twitter, he claimed that they showed signs of cosmetic work, and she hit back adding him, saying, Sorry sir, but I've never had plastic surgery of any kind. Hashtag fact, she tweeted. Then on January 15th, 2021, Jennifer posted a video on her Instagram revealing the results of that limitless glow sheet mask from her new beauty line. A fan took to the comments to accuse the singer-actress of achieving her ageless look with something more than a mask, saying you definitely had Botox and tons of it, and it's all good, just saying. Now Jennifer commented back and said, LOL, that's just my face. For the 500 millionth time, I've never done Botox or any other injectables or surgery. Just saying, get yourself some JLo beauty and feel beautiful in your skin. And here's another JLo beauty secret. Try spending your time being more positive, kind, and uplifting to others. Don't spend your time trying to bring others down. That will keep you youthful and beautiful too. Now we have the self-financed movie. Now after her album, This Is Me Now, Jennifer created her own movie based on the album called This Is Me Now, A Love Story. According to a Variety interview, the album, film, and accompanying documentary cost $20 million in total to produce. Now once it was done, Amazon then purchased the project. We went in over budget, it was a challenging project in that way. It's like there could have never been enough money for the project, she told The Hollywood Reporter. We didn't have endless funds from a studio, this was a very independent project that I was self-financing, so it was very challenging periodically. Everyone thought I was crazy when I said I would self-fund the film. We did have financing and then that fell out, she revealed. They pulled out at the last minute and then it was that moment where you go, okay, do we just make a video or do we go ahead and do this thing? Now she went ahead with it, but it wasn't really the best idea. Next we have her Mariah feud. The Jennifer Mariah feud has played out since the early 2000s and it all began with four little words Mariah Carey once uttered to a German reporter, I don't know her. Now both stars have repeatedly been asked about the comment and they can't seem to decide whether they like each other or not. When Andy Cohen brought up the feud on his show, Watch What Happens Live in 2014, Jennifer played the whole thing off saying, I don't have a feud against her at all. I know from back in the day I've read things that she said about me that were not the greatest, but we have never met. Like we don't know each other. She added, I would love to meet her and I would love to be friends with her. However, during a 2016 appearance on the Wendy Williams show, JLo had other thoughts. Mariah does say that. She's forgetful, I guess, she slammed. We've met many times. 
Now that same year, Mariah spoke to Andy Cohen about the feud and stood her ground reiterating, I don't know her, what am I supposed to say? Then following Mariah's disastrous New Year's Eve performance that December, Jennifer found an opportunity to throw shade. When an Instagram user posted about the train wreck show, writing, ever seen an accident you couldn't take your eyes away from, that was her tonight, JLo liked the post. Then, when Mariah published her memoir, The Meaning of Mariah Carey, in September 2020, she not only revealed the root of her feud with JLo, but she also made sure to throw shade at her. In the book, Mariah slams her ex-husband, Tommy Mottala, the then chairman and CEO of Sony Music Entertainment, accusing him of trying to ruin her career and getting Jennifer Lopez involved. And finally, we have her lying about products. In December 2020, Jennifer made headlines when she insisted that the secret to her flawless complexion is olive oil. The star spoke out ahead of the launch of her JLo beauty skincare range. Speaking to Page Six at the time, Jennifer said of olive oil, it's a secret I've used all over the years because it really does work. She wanted to encourage people to also be vigilant with sunscreen, explaining, one of the big things I would encourage everybody to do from the time they're 15 years old, even younger, is wear sunscreen every day. But an eagle-eyed fan may have spotted one more way that Jennifer maintains her super smooth and glowing skin in videos and photos. Filters. TikTok user at Need the Deets exposed the trick when they uploaded a clip from one of Jennifer's social media posts from February 2023, which highlighted the moment an apparent filter glitched. Wait for the filter to fall off to see JLo's real skin texture, they captioned the video. Now, in the footage, Jennifer looks absolutely flawless as she talks about going to the gym, but sure enough, at one point, she leans closer to the camera and her skin looks much more relatable. Jen quickly readjusts herself, making the glitch a blink and you'll miss it moment, but viewers still found the filter slip up hilarious. The way she jumps back when she realizes one person commented. Another observed, I love how the filter deactivated on telling. Filter literally snitched on cue. Now in fact, Jen looked so good that people shared their sadness that she even felt the need to alter her appearance online. And others argued that it isn't appropriate for Jen to digitally enhance her skin when she sells skincare products. Now regardless, if you're going to use filters, just make sure they work properly. First up, almost no celebrities want wanted to be in her movie. Now, in order for Jennifer to execute her musical film the way she envisioned the project, she had to front the budget herself. In an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, she revealed that she self-financed the movie, which cost $20 million in total to produce. JLo also had a very hard time booking celebrity cameos. In one scene, the casting director tells her, we sent out all the offers last night to everybody, and we're waiting to hear back from a few people, like Jane Fonda. A voice off camera then says, Taylor Swift is a no, Jason Momoa is not available, Jennifer Coolidge not available, Lizzo not available. JLo then says it'd be good to get Bad Bunny to do a little cameo as the bad kid, but of course that never ended up happening. It must have been a red flag that all these big names were turning down her project, but she didn't seem too bothered by it. She said, I don't want to force anybody to do this who doesn't go, this is going to be fun. Nobody wants to say no to me, Benny, I get that. That, but when an actor doesn't like a script or doesn't think it's good enough or is worried about it, that's what they'll say. I know that. I've done it. That then brings us to our next point, that she was caught lying in her documentary. Now, the project sparked controversy and backlash on TikTok, all because of the way Jennifer was talking about her upbringing in the Bronx. Now, in the documentary, Jennifer says the greatest love story never told is about facing the truth of who you really are. But that clip completely backfired when it went viral, as fans started accusing her of misrepresenting herself. Now, they see her as performative and insincere, and accused her of exaggerating her working class background, as well as her connection to the Bronx. One super clip that inspired many mocking imitations showed Jennifer tousle her hair while looking into a mirror, reminiscing about her childhood. She says, I like taking my hair out like this. It reminds me like when I was 16 in the Bronx, running up and down the block. Crazy little girl who used to be wild and no limits, all dreams. 
But even though she loves speaking about the Bronx, it's a place she actively avoids. And the reason we know that comes down to an awful ad campaign. The central premise of the ad was that sometimes JLo will drive through her old hood in the South Bronx in a Fiat 500 just to stay inspired. Now, although it sounds ridiculous, the marketing campaign obviously tried to draw on the singer's famous Jenny from the Block era. Most people recognize the song in which she pays tribute to growing up in the Bronx, which has been a solid part of her image since the 90s. Now, in fact, she even titled her debut album On the Six, which is a clear reference to the New York subway train. A press release at the time stated that she'd be traveling through the streets of Manhattan to the Bronx where she grew up. But that ad backfired when it was reported that she never actually went to the Bronx to film the ad and that a body double stand-in was used instead. Talk about faking it. Next, we have to talk about all the public fights. It's become pretty obvious that their marital bliss isn't quite as it seems because there's now repeated incidents of Ben Affleck and Jennifer being caught arguing on camera. Now, the incident that occurred was shortly after Jennifer's Today interview, with the couple filmed having what looked like a tense argument at a fight for her new movie shot. In a clip that quickly went viral on TikTok, JLo appears to taste Ben's drink and then looks at him sternly. She seems visibly upset with her husband as he tries to defend himself and repeatedly says, Jen. He could also be seen yelling over the music that he did not drink anything. Now, it was theorized at the time that Ben is insisting that he hasn't been drinking alcohol and that she was tasting his drink to check in the video. Now, Ben has been open about his recovery from alcoholism and has been to rehab multiple times over the years, like into 2001, 2017, and 2018. Now that video has been viewed around 2 million times so far, but surprisingly, most people seem to think that Jennifer is being unsupportive of Ben's struggles. Someone wrote, they just seem exhausting. This marriage will never see 18 months. Another person commented, it just looks like she doesn't trust him, picked up the drink to taste it. He's clearly upset. And there seems to be a lot of truth to that. Now let's talk about JLo's most embarrassing moment of all, when Ben slammed the car door in her face. Now the couple went viral once again while running errands in Santa Monica. Video captured of that moment shows Ben looking upset while walking to his car. He then opens the car door for Jennifer so she can get in, but once she's inside, he pretty much slams it shut. Now when that moment was shared on Twitter, everyone started guessing why he was so angry. Was it because they had gotten into an argument, or was it something else? One person wrote, maybe he's just irritated because someone is recording him. I imagine that would get very old. Another person wrote, I'm sure he's just annoyed at people pointing their phones at them while they're trying to do normal stuff. Now, considering that JLo and Ben are one of the most recognizable people in the world, there's bound to be paparazzi following them around all day. Now, it's really no wonder that he feels frustrated. And maybe that's why he's been seen in such a dark mood recently. Moving on to the embarrassing feud with her makeup artist. Scott Barnes, who's worked for JLo for the past 20 years, has had to deal with so much of her crazy hot and cold behavior. In the mid-2000s, she essentially banished him after rumors surfaced that someone had leaked info to the press about her and Mark Anthony's secret marriage ceremony. Now, speaking on the Jeff Probst show in 2012, and when asked about how JLo treated him, Scott said, quote, it was like I had the plague. Interestingly enough, eventually she ended up giving him his old job back again after learning the truth, but apparently failed to apologize for being so cold and ruthless towards him. I mean, she literally cut him off without a word and blamed him for the leak without even confronting him. Barn went on to say, quote, I went right back to work with her and we just never spoke about it again, which is even weirder. The funny thing is her celebrity makeup artist would go on to work with her for another six years and insisted that they remain on good terms, despite the fact that she ghosted him and didn't even apologize. On to the feud with Shakira. JLo didn't hold back when it came to her opinion on sharing the stage with Shakira at the 2020 Super Bowl halftime show. In her release documentary called Halftime, she labeled it as the worst idea in the world. She said, if it's going to be a double headliner, they should have given us 20 minutes. That's what they should have effing done. Basically, it turns out that Jennifer was frustrated with the NFL for booking two headliners and making them share the same amount of time, as opposed to doubling it and giving the woman extra time to shine. 
fine. Now, as a result, fans slammed the artist for coming off as entitled. While it's true that they only gave the performers six minutes each, the action packed show garnered immense praise from fans across the globe, with many fans commending the woman for showcasing their Latin heritage so brilliantly. What JLo was really mad about, though, is that previous solo headliners like Beyonce and The Weeknd received 14 minutes to perform. But judging by her complaints, it's clear that she feels offended that they asked her to share the stage at all. Next up, we have the music theft. It's no secret that Jennifer Lopez has been accused of stealing or borrowing background tracks and vocals from other artists for years. One of the stars who accused her of doing this was Usher in 2005. He claimed that she stole a song that he cast aside while recording his hugely successful album called Confessions. Usher claimed that JLo's single Get Right is actually a re-recorded version of Ride, a song that he co-wrote the year before, which was only available online. He said, I hate it, but I better get some of the publishing rights or else. I didn't put it on my album because I couldn't get it right, but I didn't expect JLo to just take it. And apart from being accused of stealing the same sample song that Mariah Carey used for Loverboy, JLo was also given songs that were initially intended for Ashanti, which is why a lot of people claim what happened between the two artists was straight up music theft. In September of 2021, JLo released I'm Real from her second studio album that she worked with Irv Gotti. But the song was already recorded and mixed with Ashanti's vocals, which is why you still hear her background vocals in Jennifer's version. Moving on to the cheating allegation. Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck have had an on again, off again romance that has been going on since the 2000s, with fans even nicknaming the couple Benifer. Now, I mean, these two just got married last year after they first got engaged nearly two decades ago. Go. But the timeline of this relationship is a huge red flag and included alleged cheating. So in July of 2002, JLo filed for divorce from her second husband, Chris Judd, citing irreconcilable differences. But this news broke just months after JLo had wrapped the movie Jilji alongside her then boyfriend, Ben. Now, even though she vehemently denied cheating rumors, Ben took out an ad in The Hollywood Reporter gushing about Jennifer before her divorce wasn't yet finalized. In fact, even Chris Judd's father, Larry, spoke out against the couple and accusing JLo of being unfaithful to his son. He insinuated that the affair started during the filming of Jill G. I thought Mr. Affleck would honor a married woman and not just go right into the trailer, and added that she'd be happier if she'd tell the truth and that no one in her little circle is going to say one negative thing to her. But we'll never really know the truth of what happened. And lastly, we have that humiliating interview. The infamous movie line interview in 1998 that could have almost ruined JLo's career was truly worse than you can imagine. She was 27 at the time, fresh off the success of her film Selena. Now, she basically decided to trash all other celebrities that were big at the time and try to trivialize their career and contributions to the industry. In fact, when asked about Madonna, she actually said, Do I think she's a great performer? Yeah, do I think she's a great actress? No. Acting is what I do, so I'm harder on people when they say, oh, I can do that, I can act. I'm like, hey, don't spit on my craft. Now, it was so ironic because Jayla would go on to do both music and acting for the rest of her career, and critics also trashed her acting on the big screen. Now, at the time, Madonna had been a star for longer than JLo, so there was really no comparison there. And when Gwyneth Paltrow was brought up, Jennifer almost seemed to laugh and made it clear that she didn't take her fellow actress's career seriously by saying, tell me what she's been in, I swear to God, I don't remember anything she was in, some people get hot by association, I heard more about her and Brad Pitt than I ever heard about her work. Yikes. Now JLo released an album called This Is Me Now, and she made a movie for it and then a documentary for it. The documentary exposed a lot about JLo and her life. It was called The Greatest Love Story Never Told, and it was about the making of the record and the film. When her husband, Ben Affleck, pops up in the dock, it's often to express concern that his private love story is becoming used for something he didn't particularly want. Which, hey, I can't blame him for that. Now, the dock is actually named after a scrapbook that Ben gifted Jennifer for Christmas in 2021, stacked with every letter and email they'd written to each other over the last 20 years. Now, Jennifer showed this book to her producers and songwriters on the first day of making her new album without asking or telling Ben. It became like our Bible, she says in the dock. We just left it in the studio. 
Now this revelation comes within the first five minutes of the dock, and right out of the gate, Ben isn't shy about his discomfort. He's shocked that Jennifer would share something so personal with her collaborators, and now of course, with the world. Ben was taken aback when Jen shared with songwriters the private love letters he wrote her to serve as inspiration for her album, This Is Me Now. Now in the doc, Jen had invited musicians into their home and gave them access to Ben's love letters. Ironically, Ben walked in at that very moment and was surprised to see the letters being passed around. I did really find the beauty and the poetry and the irony in the fact that it's the greatest love story never told, he said to the camera. If you're making a record about it, that seems kind of like telling it. Now, Reacting to the way JLo shared Ben's private letters, several Twitter users admitted that they found it invasive. Now, she could have at least asked him about it. I couldn't imagine someone sharing something as private as that with the whole world. But it appears that JLo didn't really care about his feelings, which is just sad. Now, besides the stuff with Ben, we got a sneak peek into other aspects of JLo's life, but some fans who watched it took to social media to call out Jen for her lies. Many TikTok commentators said that they see JLo as performative and insincere, accusing her of exaggerating her working class background as well as her connection to the Bronx. Now, in one scene in the dock, Jennifer poses in the mirror of her personal gym as she shakes out her hair and reminisces about her childhood in the Bronx. I like taking my hair out like this. It reminds me like when I was 16 in the Bronx, running up and down the block, crazy little girl who used to be effing wild and no limits, all dreams, she said. Now, residents of the Bronx responded to the TikTok, calling her out for her alleged contribution and connection to the neighborhood, or just simply laughing in response to the clip. One TikTok creator, Photos by Angela, posted a video alleging that she and JLo had gone to the same high school and claims to have waited years before speaking out, having been annoyed in silence. In the TikTok clip, she bluntly accuses JLo of lying and using the residents of the Bronx to look human. We both attended an all girls high school in an Irish and Italian neighborhood, so you weren't running up and down the block, she says. Now, other clips from the documentary also drew attention from TikTokers, seemingly showing Jennifer to be self absorbed. Then, in her documentary, she recalls her go to order at the local bodega while growing up. My go-to order at the bodega was a ham and cheese on a roll with an orange drink, if you know, you know, in a small bag of chips, she says. On TikTok, creators from the neighborhood have taken to the internet to express their outright confusion about JLo's bodega request. Specifically, people seem to be pretty confused about what exactly the orange drink is. Some of these creators have actually gone to the Bronx bodegas themselves to take stock of all the orange colored drinks available and try to guess which one the superstar was going on about. So no, no one really knows what the orange drink is that you're talking about JLo and they're all making fun of you. Now, back to her new album. It debuted at a disappointing number 38 on the Billboard 200, but despite this, JLo decided that she would tour with this album. Now, JLo first announced her tour in the middle of February, initially as the This Is Me Now tour, and a week later, another three shows were added. However, in mid March, several tour dates were quietly removed without explanation. Then the tour's name had been changed from This Is Me Now to This Is Me Live, The Greatest Hits. Now, it's been cited that low ticket sales is a possible reason for emphasizing JLo's back catalog. Us Weekly reports that Jennifer was disappointed in the tour's lackluster ticket sales, but remained proud of her new projects. Jennifer is very focused on her latest project and doesn't want bad press to get to her head. Now, if you go on Ticketmaster, there are a lot of tickets left, which is just kind of embarrassing. We'll just have to wait and see how the tour goes and if she cancels any more shows or even downsizes her venues, because it seems like a lot of people won't be showing up for it. The general public is losing interest in JLo quickly, and there's no way to know if it will ever come back. Now, not to mention when JLo does tour or perform, she's a total diva about it. In 2010, Jen's list of demands, which on tour specified dressing rooms with mirrors. Most specifically, hanging mirrors for her makeup had to be at specific angles. You mirror what the world mirrors to you, remains one of Jen's most famous quotes. Now, what that means in this context, I don't know. She's also known for being very particular when it comes to the decor of her dressing rooms in general. She demands to have an all white dressing room, including white candles, tables, couches, drapes, tablecloths, and flowers. 
Then there's her infamous list of food related demands that include everything she wants waiting and ready for her at the hotel. She requires a fruit platter consisting of watermelon, green seedless grapes, pineapple, and mango. She also needs a separate veggie platter, which includes carrots, broccoli, and ranch dressing. Now, of course, she also has a wide range of junk food she enjoys, including regular potato chips, soft baked chocolate chip cookies, and sour cream and onion potato chips. Additionally, JLo is nothing without her planter sunflower seeds with the shell and her plain M&Ms. As one can imagine, she has an insanely busy schedule, so she likes to have things ready to go. Now, anytime she books a hotel and she arrives early, she wants breakfast waiting for her in her room, and she requires scrambled eggs, bacon, pancakes, white toast, and potatoes. Now, she also requests regular and decaf coffee that must be ready for her arrival. Now, I know that 2010 was a long time ago, but she also had crazy requests in 2016 during her Las Vegas residency. In January of 2016, JLo began her residency in Las Vegas with her concert series, All I Have. She signed a three year contract to perform roughly 120 shows a year at Planet Hollywood's Axis Theater. Now, she makes $350,000 for each show and performs three times a week. However, the large salary wasn't enough to convince her to agree to the terms. Eventually, she signed, and in the three years from 2016 to 2018, her residency at Planet Hollywood Zappos Theater brought in over $100 million. Now, besides wanting money, she also made a few other demands. She requested three penthouse suites all next to each other, she asked for a playground in her suite for her kids, and she also demanded a personal laundry service and for each room to have its own on call butler wearing all white. Now, the housekeeping staff had to sign full disclosure agreements agreements to ensure they didn't spill any of her secrets, and she requested brand new toilets for the backstage area and, again, the all-white dressing room. Then there was the Super Bowl performance she had with Shakira. JLo had some not so nice things to say about her halftime performer. Jennifer has claimed that her Super Bowl performance with Shakira was the worst idea in the world. Now, she didn't hold back in her Netflix documentary Halftime as she slammed the NFL's decision to organize two halftime performers for the 2020 show. She said they both should have had their singing moments and hit out at organizers for giving her just six minutes. Previous performers, including Madonna and Lady Gaga, were each given more than 13 minutes to perform solo. In Jennifer's documentary, the singer tells Shakira that unnamed NFL sources told her that they'd have about 12 minutes combined to perform. However, she said they'd probably get a minute or two more added on. If it was going to be a double headliner, they should have given us 20 minutes, Jennifer said. Now, their Super Bowl halftime show ended up running for about 14 minutes, giving them seven minutes each to perform some of their biggest hits, but Jennifer did not want to share the spotlight. And don't even get me started about it being brought to light that she doesn't even really sing on her own songs and that most live performances, she lip syncs. Now, personally, I don't even know why we consider her a performer at this point. Now, it's 2024 though, and with her new tour coming up, I can't imagine how many other demands she has now. Plus, she has a net worth of about $400 million. Now, that's a lot of money, and she could pretty much get whatever she wants, but will anyone ever tell the singer no and to stop being a diva? Not to mention, there's all the people in Hollywood that straight up don't like JLo. But, I mean, there is a reason for it. An old interview by JLo has resurfaced, and she's not speaking too well about her fellow colleagues in the industry. This is what she had to say about two major stars at the time. Gwyneth Paltrow, tell me what she's been in, I swear to God, I don't remember anything she was in. Some people get hot by association. I heard more about her and Brad Pitt than I ever heard about her work. Now for Madonna, she said, do I think she's a great performer? Yeah. Do I think she's a great actress? No. Acting is what I do, so I'm harder on people when they say, oh, I can do that, I can act. I'm like, hey, don't spit on my craft. Now the funny thing about this is that Jennifer said this after only having Selena in the movie Anaconda under her belt for her career. Now it's embarrassing, but I'm glad that people are calling her out for this behavior. Now currently, she's going through a lot of drama with her marriage to Ben Affleck. There's been rumors of divorce, with the pair living apart, not being seen together, and sometimes not even wearing their wedding bands. Now, there's been a lot of speculation from the media, which I'm sure hasn't been helping, so who knows if she'll act out because of it. Usher was left out of an important decision once, and it led to some legal troubles for JLo. The song in question here is Get Right. 
Get Right was written by Usher and producer Rich Harrison for Confessions. The album was released by Usher in 2004. The song was originally called Ride. The thing was, it wasn't good enough for the album or something went wrong, either way it didn't make the cut and vault tracks weren't common yet so the song sat there until JLo was interested. Harrison decided to give the track to JLo, presumably without checking with Usher first if his reaction is anything to go off of. Usher claimed he didn't sign off on the decision and was quick to demand publishing rights. Obviously the song made it out on JLo's side as it was released and is now considered a fan favorite. Seanette Harrell sang the chorus to popular JLo song If You Had My Love but was credited as just a background singer. Having others lend vocals to songs is super common in Hollywood. In recent years it's more common that people will sing the majority of their song and other voices will truly be background vocals. It seems in this case Harrell might not have been credited properly if she really Really did sing the chorus and JLo is just lip syncing along. Likely though, JLo did put some vocals in there mixed in with uh, Harrell handling the brunt of it. As for crediting the person as a background singer, the vocals were mixed in a way that the background vocals typically were, plus there is no way to actually know if JLo was the one to sign off on that. Christina Milian is now a singer and actress. You might recognize her from the Netflix movie Falling in Love, the Kim Possible theme song, or the JLo song Play. Christina co wrote the song and did record some vocals for it, vocals that can be heard on JLo's version of the track. But as we know now, that did not happen. But JLo did kind of steal her work, not really because she would have had to get permission, but you know what I mean. People thought maybe Christina felt negatively towards JLo. It turns out that is very much not the case. In an interview with Page Six, Christina got to clear up any rumors swirling around the internet. She said there is nothing malicious between her and JLo. She talked quite highly of the singer and even explaining that she was okay not being fully credited for the track, saying hands down she killed it. She's so good. I love that song. I'm on the credits for whatever nature as a writer and for singing backgrounds. There is credit for that. I'm also just so happy that she did it because she's an icon. She's amazing. It's funny when people talk about this being kind of a thing. About about me singing on the song with Jennifer. I mean, I have background singers on some of my songs. It's no different than Michael Jackson having background singers on songs or Britney Spears. This is what music is made of. You want a blend of voices. It makes songs better to me. She even clarified why the song went to JLo, explaining that she liked another party song she had written more, AM to PM, and figured that only one would make the album, so she passed on play. JLo caught it and recorded it, doing some rewrites with Christina, and then it was off and hitting the charts. Ironically, it could be argued JLo's song, I'm Real, is not very real at all. Ashanti is the real deal here, at least when it comes to the chorus and ad libs and the writing of the song. Allegedly, the song I'm Real by Jennifer Lopez was written by Ashanti. She sung the demo that was given to JLo. Usually, artists, when they get demos, they just use it to see what the song will sound like. Then they re record the song because it's their song now and they want their vocals. At least that's what one might think. In this case, and a few more cases, that we've looked at and will look at. It looks like JLo did not re record anything, just kept the demo vocals and the ad libs. Ashanti received credit for background vocals, but the co writing credit was nowhere to be found. So while JLo likely got permission from either the performer or the company, it wasn't a good look in the eyes of the public. To make the entire situation worse, JLo, who is Puerto Rican, used the N word on the track. That was met with the appropriate response and call outs. I'm Real was so successful. Successful that Ashanti did write for JLo again, so there must not have been too much bad blood between the women. She came back to write Ain't It Funny, also adding some ad lib vocals into this song. She did get to appear in the music video for this one. It's hard to imagine any JLo song being more popular than Jenny from the Block, but for a brief moment, all I have was the moment. While most of the song was JLo's vocals, part of the chorus was sampled from Deborah Law's song Very Special. Very Special came out in 1981 and JLo's song in 2002, so quite a bit of time between the two. Sony did get permission to use the sample, however, no one told the original singer Deborah Law, so she took JLo to court. The case was dismissed, she tried again, and it was dismissed again. Specifically, she went to court over the sample, but that doesn't mean it was Law's vocals on the JLo track. The part of the chorus that wasn't JLo was a woman named Makiba Riddick. Riddick was with Rock Nation at the time. Makiba does have a connection to another famous track, Love the Way You Lie, featuring Rihanna. She produced Rihanna's vocals. 
This one is mainly a fan rumor and speculation. Kunela Cox was a background singer on Jennifer Lopez's tours and was possibly a vocalist on her hit song, Love Don't Cost a Thing. Love Don't Cost a Thing is one of JLo's biggest hits, so it makes sense it would eventually be examined with a magnifying glass, or I guess just a good ear to pick apart to see if JLo is singing. Some fans would argue that in parts of the song, she isn't, that instead of JLo's vocals being heard, it's actually Cox. Cox is not that big of an artist, unfortunately, though she is very talented. She released some of her own music and albums back in the early 2000s but they didn't do very well. A leaked demo caused people to listen to Lopez's signature track, Jenny from the Block, a little more closely, as it was rumored that JLo didn't even sing part of her most popular tune, and that some vocals actually belonged to Natasha Ramos. Of all the people on this list, Natasha is probably one of the most outspoken. She has used her multiple social media accounts to prove her involvement with the hit song. Using her ex account, she tweets out her demo for the song, telling people to compare for yourselves. However, that was mainly in response to people saying she was lying about ever being involved, involved with the track. Back in 2019, she tweeted a short summary of her involvement, writing, I just want to clarify something. JLo did indeed go into the studio and lay down some background vocals over mine. So I wouldn't say she's so much lip syncing. However, the backgrounds are predominantly me, some ad libs, and laughs as well. So that is nice to get. Cleared up. JLo is technically still singing her biggest song, just with a little more help than we may have thought. Social media star Samantha Barbash was the inspiration behind the critically acclaimed film Hustlers, produced and starring Jennifer Lopez. Samantha, however, does not appreciate the film and actually sued JLo and her company for defamation. Samantha shared her perspective on the situation in an interview with TMZ. She said, They basically stole my story. I wouldn't sign my rights away. I wasn't giving away my film and TV rights for peanuts. JLo doesn't work for free. Why would I? Further claiming that 87% of the film made was wrong. Samantha's case was ultimately dismissed. Brandy might have been the one mad at JLo for taking her song, but she has also now accidentally, maybe purposely, roped herself into the feud between Mariah Carey and JLo. Let's start with the Brandy drama. Brandy wrote a song called Ride or Die for her album, Aphrodisiac. The problem was there was a bunch of delays with the album, and for some reason, those delays meant that Brandy no longer had the song and it went to JLo for her rebirth album. Ride or Die did still keep quite a few Brandy vocals, though, which I can only imagine added fuel to the feud fire. How did Brandy get into the decades long feud with Mariah and JLo though? Well, she posted a picture with Carrie in 2017 and captioned it, hashtag she knows me, to which Carrie confirmed the comments, I sure do. This exchange might mean nothing to the average person, but to JLo fans, this was a declaration of war. See, back in the early 2000s when JLo was starting to become a major name and Mariah Carey was releasing hits left and right, Carrie was on a red carpet and the topic moved to Lopez. To which Carrie replied with, I don't know her. Such a simple sentence, and yet it ignited decades long feuds. So that's what JLo fans believe Brandy was referencing with her hashtag caption. But that one little comment on Carrie's part could not have possibly been the thing to ignite the feud. Maybe the straw that broke the camel's back, but it certainly wasn't the first thing to happen between the pair. The first big step was probably, if you look at it from Mariah Carey's perspective, when JLo stole a never before sampled song from her ahead of her album release. That was pretty bad. The song that had never been sampled before was Firecracker by Yellow Magic Orchestra. Mariah wanted it for her upcoming song, Loverboy, so she of course applied for a license. The only thing was her ex-husband must have hated her because he also applied for the same song and unfortunately for Carrie, beat her out. So JLo's track, I'm Real, got the sample and it also featured vocals from another singer named Shailene Thomas. Presumably this fiasco is what sparked the flames of the feud. Now first up we have to talk about her music theft. It's no secret that Jennifer Lopez has been accused of stealing or borrowing background tracks and vocals from other artists for years. Now, one of the stars who accused her of doing this was Usher in 2005. He claimed that she stole a song that he cast aside while recording his hugely successful album called Confessions. Usher claimed that JLo's single Get Right is actually a re recorded version of Ride, a song that he co wrote the year before, which was only available online. He 
He said, quote, I hate it, but I'd better be getting some of the publishing rights or else. I didn't put it on my album because I couldn't get it right, but I didn't expect JLo to just take it. And apart from being accused of stealing the same sample song that Mariah Carey used for Loverboy, JLo was also given songs that were initially intended for a shanty. Which is why a lot of people claim what happened between the two artists was straight up music theft. In September 2001, Lopez released I'm Real from her second studio album, JLo, that she worked with Iv Gotti. But the song was already recorded and mixed with Ashanti's vocals, which is why you still hear her in the background vocals in Lopez's version. Moving on to the embarrassing feud with her makeup artist. Scott Barnes, who's worked for JLo for the last 20 years, has had to deal with so much of her crazy hot and cold behavior. In the mid 2000s, she essentially banished him after rumors surfaced that someone had leaked info to the press about her and Mark Anthony's secret marriage ceremony. Speaking on the Jeff Probst show in 2012, and when asked about how JLo treated him, Scott said, It was like I had the plague. Interesting enough, eventually she she ended up giving him his old job back after learning the truth, but apparently failed to apologize for being so cold and ruthless towards him. I mean, she literally cut him off without a word and blamed him for the leak without even confronting him. Barnes went on to say, I went right back to work with her and we never spoke about it again, which is even weirder. Now the funny thing is, her celebrity makeup artist would go on to work with her for another six years and insisted that they remained on good terms, despite the fact that she ghosted him and didn't even even apologize. Next we have sharing the stage. JLo didn't hold back when it came to her opinion on sharing the stage with Shakira at the 2020 Super Bowl halftime show. In her newly released documentary called Halftime, she labeled it as the worst idea in the world. If I was going to be a double headliner, they should have given us 20 minutes, that's what they should have effing done, she said. Basically it turns out that Jennifer was frustrated with the FNL for booking two headliners and making them share the same amount of time that any soul solo performer would receive, as opposed to doubling it and giving the women extra time to shine. As a result, fans slam the artist for coming off as entitled. While it's true that they only gave the performers 6 minutes each, the action packed show garnered immense praise from fans across the globe, with many fans commending the woman for showcasing their Latin heritage so brilliantly. What JLo was really mad about though is that previous solo headliners like Beyonce and The Weeknd received 14 minutes to perform. But judging by her complaints, it's clear that she feels offended that they even asked her to share the stage at all. Next we have the cheating allegations. Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck have had an on and off again romance that has been going on since the 2000s, with fans even nicknaming the couple Benifer. Now I mean these two just got married after they first got engaged nearly two decades ago. But the timeline of their relationship is a huge red flag and include alleged cheating. So in July of 2022, Lopez filed for divorce from her second husband, Chris Judd, citing irreconcilable differences. But this news broke just months after Lopez had wrapped the movie Jilji along her then boyfriend Ben. Even though she vehemently denied cheating rumors, Ben took out an ad in The Hollywood Reporter gushing about Lopez before her divorce wasn't yet finalized. In fact, even Chris Judd's father, Larry, spoke out against the couple and accusing JLo of being unfaithful to his son. He insinuated that the affair started during the filming of the GLG, quote, I thought Mr. Affleck would honor a married woman and not just go right into the trailer, and added that she'd be happier if she'd just tell the truth, and no one in her little circle is going to say one negative thing about her. But we'll never really know the truth of what happened. Now this brings us to our next point, the Mark Anthony romance. Celebrity gossip magazines could not get enough of the power couple in the early 2000s. They were absolutely everywhere, and it seems like fans loved the pairing. But their beginnings as a couple were super questionable to say the least. Anthony married former Miss Universe Dana Nera Torres in 2000 while Lopez was dating Ben Affleck around the same time. But the on again off again couple picked their romance back up when Anthony was still married to Dayanara. So less than a week after Anthony's divorce was finalized, the couple surprised fans by getting married in a small 
casual ceremony in her Beverly Hills home in early June. It really begs the question of whether or not JLo was some kind of homewrecker because the timeline of the rekindled relationship seems really off. I mean, he actually broke Dana Era's heart as she said, You go through hell. I cried until there were no tears left, until I was numb. I didn't want to eat. I didn't care to get dressed or take a shower. I just wanted to lie there. Now, Anthony's feelings for Jennifer might have been there all along because the two had a history, but he should have put more thought into who he chose to marry in the first place. So, in a way, they're both at fault. And now, let's talk about the insensitive comments. So, to give some background on why everyone felt that JLo was trashing belly dancing, a part of the 2020 Super Bowl performance featured young dancers sitting in glowing cages, which many people assumed represent the immigrant children in cages at the US border. But JLo apparently had a hard time convincing the NFL to do this and said, I'm trying to give you something with substance, not just us out there shaking our effing asses and effing belly dancing. She went on to say that she wanted something real, something that's gonna make a statement, something that's gonna say we belong here and we have something to offer. Now, if you're confused as to why this was controversial, it's essentially because she compared the art of belly dancing to just shaking your butt for the hell of it. In fact, that particular line was shared across Twitter and people were big mad. It was just a little culturally insensitive to say, considering that the dance has long been associated with Middle Eastern cultures and that's something that Shakira has become known for, using it to channel her father's Lebanese Syrian Arab roots. Next up, we have a voice. The Bronx. This one train wreck of an ad campaign led to people openly mocking both Chrysler and Jennifer Lopez. Now, the central premise of the ad was that sometimes Julo will drive through her old hood in the South Bronx in a Fiat 500 just to stay inspired. Although it sounds ridiculous, the marketing campaign obviously tried to draw on the singer's famous Jenny from the Block era. Most people recognize the song, in which she pays tribute to growing up in the Bronx, which has been a solid part of her image since the 90s. In fact, the singer even titled her debut album on the 6, which is a clear reference to the New York subway train. Now, a press release at the time stated that she'd be traveling through the streets of Manhattan to the Bronx where she grew up. But the ad backfired when the smoking gun reported that Lopez never actually went to the Bronx to film the ad and that a body double stand in and was used instead, calling it, quote, it is such a breathtaking assemblage of hoary urban cliches and that was putting it lightly. Next, we have the movie line interview. The infamous movie line interview in 1998 that could have almost ruined JLo's career was truly worse than you can imagine. She was 27 at the time and fresh off the success of her film Selena. Now she basically decided to trash all other celebrities that were big at the time and try to trivialize their career and contribution to the industry. In fact, when asked about Madonna, she actually said, Do I think she's a great performer? Yeah. Do I think she's a great actress? No. Acting is what I do, so I'm harder on people and they say, Oh, I can do that. I can act. I'm like, hey, don't spit on my craft. Now, this is so ironic because JLo would go on to do both music and acting for the rest of her career, and critics also trashed her acting on the big screen. Also, at the time, Madonna had been a star for longer than JLo, so there was really no comparison there. And when Gwyneth Paltrow was brought up, Jennifer almost seemed to laugh and made it clear that she didn't take her fellow actress's career seriously, saying, tell me what she's been in, I swear to God, I don't remember anything she was in. Some people get hot by association. I heard more about her and Brad Pitt than I ever heard about her work. Yikes. Moving on to the accusations of racism. 20 years ago, Lopez was approaching a full actualization as an entertainer, but a single from her second album, JLo, almost derailed her career entirely. The Murder Inc. remix of I'm Real, which features Ja Rule and owned the radio in 2001, was ruined by the N word she drops in her final verse. Now, the issue was that the song was an instant hit, so much that 10 years later in 2011, Billboard gave it the sixth spot on its 40 biggest debuts of all time. List. But rightfully so, people were outraged by her use of the loaded term. Not only because she's a Latina artist, but at her level of success where she has a platform and sets an example to young fans, using such a derogatory word is at best offensive. But as the accusations of racism started to mount against the star, she eventually spoke out to defend her actions on the Today Show. For anyone to think or suggest that I'm racist is really absurd and hateful to me. Although many people think this is not an excuse, it was later revealed that the track was actually written by 
by Jay Rule himself, and he encouraged her to say it. And lastly, we need to talk about the awful reasons she had a maid fired. Now, this one is really indefensible. Jennifer Lopez allegedly got a German hotel maid fired for asking for an autograph. Prey Dojo was a staff member at the luxury Melia Hotel in Dusseldorf, Germany during Lopez's stay in 2012. She was a big fan of JLo and worked at the Courage to knock on the star's hotel door to ask for an autograph and was promptly turned away. Prey claims that she was relieved from her post the day after the incident. She told The Sun, I am an incredibly big fan, so I took all of my courage and rang the doorbell to get an autograph, but I was rejected by two assistants at the door. A day later, the cleaning company that employed me at the hotel called and said that Miss Lopez had complained. I was fired right there on the phone. If the incident really happened, it's hard to ignore the irony when you remember that Jennifer played a hotel maid in the movie Made in Manhattan. Now, after receiving a rightful amount of backlash, the pop star wrote on Twitter, Come on, thought you knew me better than this. Would never get anyone fired over an autograph. First I've heard of this was on Twitter. Hashtag hurtful. So, according to Danny Minogue, it was, for her, it was JLo's insane ultimatums. And she's not alone in that. Some of the reports about local Lopez's most egregious sounding on set demands and ultimatums aren't just from projects she stars in, but also even when she's appearing on a show just for a single day. According to a report her B for her BBC interview, Lopez required enough dressing rooms for a 90 person entourage if she was going to show up on the day of. In 2022, Danny Minogue shared what JLo was like on their shared episode of Top of the Pops. Minogue and Lopez were set to feature during the same filming, but Lopez at the last second threatened not to show. And according to Minogue, it was unless her backstage room was redecorated. I was told everything had to be white, including the sofa. All I could think is girlfriend is covered head to toe in body makeup. How do you sit on an all white couch? Meanwhile, when she's the star of the show, the show is quite literally revolving around her power tripping schedule. According to an insider who spoke to Now Magazine in 2011, Lopez demanded to eat at exact times every day, no matter what was happening. If the natural lighting was just right, if everything was set up perfectly, Lopez would still walk off set at 10.15 on the dot to eat food specially made for her. This source was from the set of What to Expect When You're Expecting, a movie that J.Lo filmed with Cameron Diaz, and the two famously didn't get along following our next worst J.Lo moment, the movie line interview, which went down in history, man. In an era of interviews PR managed within an inch of their lives, it's rare for a major star to shred into another, let alone half a dozen. But times were different in 1998, and while speaking the movie line, Jennifer Lopez appeared on a mission to burn bridges with every female actor of her generation. When asking Lopez why she believed she was even popular in Hollywood at the time, her answer was simply because I'm the best. During that interview described as an orchestrated and deliberate scene, JLo's lounging by her swimming pool mid-massage as she proceeds to say that Cameron Diaz was a lucky model who had been given a lot of opportunities I just wish she would have done more with. That she didn't know any work Gwen Paltrow did and that she was famous by association to Brad Pitt. Oh, she also said she wasn't a fan of Winona Ryder. And even S-shamed Salma Hayek and bravely slated another multi talent Madonna by saying, do I think she's a great actress? No, acting is what I do. So I'm harder on people when they say, oh, I can that, I can act. I'm like, hey, don't spit on my craft. Your craft, JLo? Bit of a stretch for someone who bit the hand who fed her. And I'm of course talking about her relationship with Rosie Perez, because JLo wouldn't have a career without her, yet bashes her. Perez was the choreographer at an open casting call for In Living Color in 1991. While the show's creator called JLo a chubby and corny looking girl during audition, Rosie saw potential in dancing, was adamant they gave JLo a chance. But in her autobiography, Perez recalled that soon, quote, all of the girls are coming into my office, complaining how JLo is manipulating wardrobe, manipulating makeup, and me, all to her advantage, Perez wrote. Adding in that when she confronts Lopez about this, she reacted like, quote, some ghetto biatch, screaming and pounding her chest. Though Lopez left in living color after just two seasons, once she made it big in Hollywood, she went right on a smear campaign on Perez, making disparaging comments about the woman. I was blindsided, Perez said. I thought we were cool. I called her up and she wouldn't pick up. And then the next time the pair run into each other, JLo pretends nothing ever happened. Nothing new. JLo likes to pretend a lot of things, like that her career wasn't built off of theft. It starts, of course, with Sony chairman Tommy Mottola and his contentious divorce from Mariah Carey. The newly Sony side JLo was young and pretty and very desperate. So, ugh. Tommy chose to use her as his pawn to try and sabotage Mariah's glitter soundtrack. And he did so by giving JLo the same samples and beats he saw Mariah using. Mariah's single still comes out on top, but Matola did, however, find success in damaging Mariah's career, and JLo and her team learned that her success laid in using the work of other artists. She especially profited off of black underground artists, either by literally using their vocals or by taking and rewriting.
writing their songs with differing lyrics. Said artists were those like Shante Moore, Christina Millian, Usher, Mariah Carey, and of course Ashante, who wrote Ain't It Funny, and Natasha Ramos, who wrote Jenny from the Block. Both artists' backgrounds, ad libs, laughs, and main vocals were used in the songs, but uncredited. JLo's theft of music became so persistent and even repetitive for some artists that many began leaking their own music so JLo wouldn't steal it. And Usher was the first, but definitely not the last, to loudly sue the singer and win for it. But just like JLo, since the block was mentioned, I'm now going to bring it up and tell numerous stories about it. This first one, uh, how Jenny caused a fiasco. So Lopez once started in a Fiat commercial in which she drove around the Bronx and explained why her old neighborhood continues to inspire her. Her deal with the Italian manufacturer was reportedly worth millions, yet she refused to actually return to the block that she sang about and forced Fiat to find a body double to do so. The owner of Mott Haven Barbershop, seen in the ad, said the commercial featuring the Fiat 500 car drove up and down the street of East 136, but Lopez was not at the wheel. Instead, it was a double that looked like her. JLo's people refused to comment on it, but Fiat was forced to, and they make a public statement explaining that the body double was because of scheduling decisions. I guess I can't be too surprised given that JLo even went so as far to refuse financial aid to her own old high school and community. Jenny from the Block has donated rather stingily and minimally over the years to charity, but never to her own suffering neighborhood, which has now been criticized by her former principal, Claire Latampa from the Holy Family School, for allegedly turning her back on the community. Latampa, who worked alongside the star's own mother, Lupe, at the school, tells the New York Daily News, Jennifer hasn't even sent us a CD. Her mother Lupe was wonderful. A sweetie. Wonderful with the kids. When Jennifer became famous, I asked Lupe if Jennifer could donate a scholarship in her name, and Lupe said, uh-uh, that's her money and that's it. The school board has since sent inquiries to the singer in the past, asking for potential scholarships be set up in her name for prominent music or dance students, but they've received no response. And Latempa adds that the recession hit parents hard. Many of them are single mothers. A lot have lost their job. And she said, I have one mother who worked at St. Vincent's Hospital for 25 years who's out of work. It's a hard time for families to make tuition, I keep praying she'll donate. It's hard to imagine JLo will donate anything though when she did something like the casino reclaim. Several TikTok users have accused Lopez of not tipping her wait staff, but two stories in particular take the cake, or in this case, the tip. So TikTok user uh, Penny claims that her friend, once employed at the Las Vegas Tavern, told her about serving Ben Affleck one night and he gave said friend a 10k tip for the service. But once JLo caught wind of the tip money, she allegedly took it back. Apparently Affleck was so mortified that the next day he sent a bouquet and $25,000 tip to the server. In a second TikTok now deleted, a woman corroborates this story, claiming the couple's notoriously anti-tipping. Lopez tells Affleck not to tip. He doesn't tip anymore though, baby. You don't need to tell him nothing. He ain't doing it. Taking back tips is some next level behavior from a millionaire like JLo, but the woman also cares so little about livelihood of others, she makes her staff jump through hoops. So, a flight attendant told Star Magazine how JLo refused to even acknowledge him after he asked to take her drink order. Instead, she turned her head away and told her personal assistant, please tell him I'd like a Diet Coke and a lime. And in 2022, amid TikTok's storm of fans sharing negative encounters with Lopez, one user, Kayla, shared how her father worked for a driving company, but he refused to drive for JLo after learning her rules. Drivers can't look at her or talk to her, they can't let her luggage touch the ground, and if they even glance through the rear view mirror at her, they could be subjected to a scolding. This is believable since a woman on Quora, Emily Watford, shared her experience working in a concert arena and watching a doorman get fired for making eye contact with JLo. And there is rumors of a construction crew from her house who were all banned from eye contact as well. It's absolutely insane to me though how stingy JLo is given how much money she makes, but even worse is she has incredibly low standards for earning it as well. Like performing for dictators? According to the Human Rights Watch, Turkmenistan is one of the world's most repressive countries. So it was little surprise that JLo is heavily criticized when she agreed to perform for its president's 56th birthday celebrations in 2013. This man's a tyrant responsible for breaching countless human rights laws, and she declared, it was our pleasure towards the end of her set, and we wish you the very happiest of birthdays. Lopez representatives pleaded ignorance following the public backlash, one claiming in a statement that the A-lister would have turned down the invitation if she'd been aware of the president's past, as if she doesn't have access to Google. It would have been a viable excuse also if JLo hadn't already done similarly before. She took to the stage for an Aussie oligarch, and then a Uzbek businessman's wedding for a million dollar sum. And ahead of two controversial gigs in Russia, she reportedly told fans, I don't like to talk politics to be quite honest. But she seems really okay dropping political words. You know like when JLo thought everyone would let her get away with dropping a slur in her 2001 remix of I'm Real. Not only did the song have zero similarity to the original whatsoever, but the Latina singer bravely drops the n-word in the opening verse. Penned by Jerule, who 
who also rapped on the record and its producer Irv Gotti. The track quickly came under fire from Hot 97, Star and Buckwild, the morning radio DJs implored listeners to voice their disapproval of the song and even planned to throw rice and beans at Lopez when she took to the Rockefeller Center's outdoor plaza stage for the Today Show. Edward Hawkins told the Washington Post at the event, the singer still needs to make amends, stating when your music is geared towards suburbanites, there's a certain way you should carry yourself. Using a word like that when less than a third of her audience is African American or Latino is inappropriate. Lopez however never apologized for the stunt, instead insisting and I quote, for anyone to think or suggest or say that I'm racist is really absurd and hurtful to me. A statement which very obviously doesn't actually even address her usage of the word at all, let alone the true reason that people were criticizing her.